Well, good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship, where we overdose on fellowship. You know, if you have to have a problem in the church, that's a pretty good one to have. It is. Before we jump in, let's pray. Lord, it is truly the day that you have made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. We set our hearts to come here to seek your face, Lord, that as we look at your timeless word, that you might uncover things about our heart and our mind so that we might be more shaped into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your grace that you showed to us, and I thank you for the Christmas season that we can remember the greatest gift that was ever given that we might emulate that with one another. Lord, I thank you for being here. I thank you for everyone that's here. I pray that your Holy Spirit would stir us up and move us to see you today, that we might understand something more of what we can look forward to in the way that you deal with us because of the, the way you've dealt with people previously. Lord, you know our hearts and you know the things that trouble us. You know our joys and our sorrows, and you know our failures, and you love us the same. I'm grateful for that. Help us today, Lord. Nourish our souls in the place where only you know it needs to be nourished. So, Lord, we give you this time in ourselves, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going through the book of Genesis, and we're in chapter 17. So we're going to talk about... The covenant that God made. Now, if you remember, the Lord came and made a covenant with Abraham previously, and he's going to come and reinstitute it, but he's going to ask for a little something in return. He's going to ask for a little bit of a, uh, a token. In verse 10, it says, This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And it was quiet that day. <laughs> we even go through the life of Abram to see how God has called Abram and put his hand upon him and said, listen, I want to do something. I want to show myself to the world and I'm going to choose you and your family line because you're just old enough to know that you can't have kids naturally and it'll be a miracle. Which if you're saved and you know the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe that's why he saved you. The apostle Paul said that he saved me because I was the worst of all sinners so that everybody would know that there's room for them. And I appreciate that. So we're going to look, first we looked at Abram's testing of his family ties. God says, take, take Sarah, your wife, and leave. Leave your kindred, leave your kin, leave everybody and your land, and go to a place that I will show you. And he doesn't do such a great job. He ends up bringing his dad with him, and he brings his nephew with him, and he goes north instead of going west. He's probably a lot like us. Sometimes we don't get the test the first time. Any of you like taking tests? Especially if it's a surprise test. But he gets tested in his family ties. Is God going to be more important than even your family? And will you be obedient to him even if he asks you to leave a place you're comfortable with? And that was Abram's test here. The next one was once you, once you finally get to paradise and you, you settle in, what are you going to do when it gets difficult? Are you going to stay where God's planted you? And Abram goes to Canaan and suddenly there's a famine. So he goes, well, this is great. God led me here and it stinks. So I'm going to go to Egypt, which sounds like a great idea, but it's just not. And so he doesn't hold fast. And so he gets tested again and compromises, lies about his wife and all of these things. And you get to see the character of a real human being like you and me, where we look for shortcuts. Don't you look for shortcuts? Especially if there's a big, long line of traffic. I always look for shortcuts. I like... I'm in a little go-kart anyway, so I, I go through the, the back roads and I enjoy it. But this shortcut wasn't so good because it was a compromise and he ends up lying and embarrassing himself and ruining his witness before Pharaoh, who doesn't even know God. 
He gets tested with this humility when he and Lot can't live in the same area any longer. God creates this dysfunction, this kind of a holy dissatisfaction with them so that they have to separate. And Abram says, listen, if you go left, I'll go right. You go right, I'll go left. And Lot looks at this well-watered valley and he goes, that's what I want. And it just so happens to be by Sodom. And so he chooses what appears to be the nicest grazing land and the best place to grow up, and we know it doesn't end well. But it's a real test of his tenacity. Are you going to stay in a place where God wants you to be? And are you going to be humble with the people that you have to deal with that maybe you have trouble with? Uh, Lots of people up and leave churches because of the smallest little thing. Uh, Maybe you're one of them. Maybe I'll never see you again. Anyway... (laughs) Are you going to stay, are you going to be humble when things get difficult and when there's friction? And this is the the test. And and Abram takes the low place, even though he's the senior in the two of them. He says, wherever you want to go, you go, and I'll go the other place. We see this test of courage with Abram, where Lot gets taken captive, and we have these five kings that take over these, the, the four kings that take over the five kings in the south and take Lot and his wife and his children and everything he has, and they just start going home with it, and they level the city. And Abram hears about it, and he takes 318 guys of his own household that are armed warriors. These are, these are bodyguards, if you will, and goes after them, gets all the stuff back, rescues Lot and his family and everything. God gives them a great victory, a test of his courage. He comes back, meets this character, Melchizedek, who's the king of Salem and the priest of the Most High God. And it's a real test of his humility. And he makes a commitment there that he won't take anything from the hand of the king of Sodom because he says, listen, I want to pay you for what you did. And he goes, I won't take a penny from you because you'll boast about it. And you'll say, ah, Abram's rich because I made him rich. He goes, I don't want any of that. I want God to get all the glory. So I'm not taking a penny from you. And so he was tested not only with his courage, but also with his greed. We see the test of trust when the Lord says that he's going to make a covenant And he had to do and perform this covenant and cut all of these animals in half. And, you know, you have to walk through and he's kind of waiting on God and God's not showing up exactly. And, you know, he has to scare the birds away to keep them away from eating the sacrifice before he makes the covenant. And and the Lord comes to him in a vision and he sees this, this pot and this torch that just comes through the pieces. And God makes a covenant with him without Abram having to walk through with him. In other words, it's a unilateral, it's a covenant that God makes that's not conditional. And so we saw that. Last week, we talked about the test of patience. God said, I'm going to give you a son. And he waited. He waited for 11 years. It didn't happen. Sarai comes with this great idea. Hey, listen, what about my handmaid? She's young. She can bear children, and she can bear our child. Maybe that's what God meant. Because, you know, I'm like an old dish rag. It ain't going to happen. It's the Jersey version. So, So Sarai makes this great decision on this leftover from Egypt in which they acquired her, and this leftover of compromise ends up staying in their house, and she ends up laying with Abram, and Abram consents to do this. Because, you know, God helps those that help themselves. No, not really. And so she says, yeah, I want you to just go into my handmaid and she'll bear children. So she's like a surrogate. And they used to do this in the culture. Don't try this at home. (laughs) This was the culture then. And so they tried this. to to see if they could bear a child. Well, that creates problems between Sarai and Hagar because they both now are married. In fact, Sarah gives her as a wife to Abraham. If my wife ever brought home a replacement wife, I know it's a test. And I will say no. Because someone will die. But what happens is immediately Hagar becomes pregnant and suddenly she despises her mistress. She's like, ha ha, 
look, I could do it and you can't do it, which Sarai gets crazy and begins to abuse her because of that. Hagar jumps ship and runs away. Her name means flight anyway. And so she's on the way back to Egypt. She stops at a place called Shur. Shur is a place where they have a whole bunch of uh, forts and it's on the very border of Egypt. So she's heading home to where she's from, but it's an amber alert because she's carrying Abram's child. She's kidnapped his child and you don't understand that. And what she's doing is illegal because she's really not a wife. She's a servant who's a surrogate and she has no right to take Abram's child away. And yet she does because of Sarai's unhappiness with the whole situation that she created. And she goes, well, my decision be on your head, Abram. That's great. Just blame somebody else for your mess. And so the angel of the Lord comes to her. And it's interesting. This is the first appearance of the angel of the Lord. And we realize that this is the Lord Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ, the theophany. Christ shows up because she calls him God. And you don't call angels God. This is a physical appearing of God for the very first time. And he comes to a Gentile. You'd think he'd show up, you know, for Abram, right, first? He shows up for a Gentile who's running away and in, in the worst possible situation you can be. She's pregnant, alone, and she's running away from those who have a right to her. And the Lord comes to her. And she says, the angel of the Lord came to me and says, where, where have you been and where are you heading? And she says, I'm running away from my mistress. And he says, well, what you need to do is return. You need to go back to your mistress. Notice he doesn't call her wife. He calls her a servant because he didn't arrange the marriage. Sarai did. So as far as God's concerned, it's not really a marriage. It's a different situation. And so the angel of the Lord, we see who that is because it's the Lord that she recognizes. And it, he's, they called the well where she was Bir Lahoi Roy, which means the Lord hears me. And she said, she, it was told her that she's going to have a son and his name will be Ishmael, which means the Lord hears. Isn't that interesting? The Lord used this whole situation so that his name is going to reflect this moment. God hears. And so she says, okay. And she goes back and she has Ishmael. This week, we're going to look at the covenant of circumcision. I won't ask for a show of hands. <laughs> but this is a test for Abraham as well because it's, it's a self-sacrifice for Abram because God is going to ask him to do something that is incredibly radical and cuts to the very core of the most sensitive part of who you are as a man. And he's going to ask him to do something. And it's not a surprise that it happens just after this incident with Hagar. I don't know if you put that together before. Well, let's dive into it. Verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant and your descendants after you throughout your generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep 
between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He was eight days old among you. You shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he was born in your house or bought with your money or any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And your covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And God said to Abram, as for Sarai, your wife, which means contentious, you shall not call her, uh, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. And then I will bless her. And she shall be a mother of nations, kings and peoples shall come from her. And Abram fell on, Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And he said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who's a hundred years old? He was rounding off. So you don't say, oh, see, the Bible's wrong. He's a hundred. He's looking forward to it. And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Ishmael's 13 years old, by the way. Then God said, no, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant, I will establish with Isaac whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. And then he finished talking with him and God went up from Abraham. So Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all who were born in his house and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins. That very same day, as God had said to him, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 year old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very same day, Abraham was circumcised and his son Ishmael. And all the, son of his, all the men of his house, born in the house, who were bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised by him kind of makes you not want to be the head of the household because <laughs> you play doctor literally. So let's take this apart. Abr Abram is 99 years old. God promised him 26 years ago that he'd give him a child. Hasn't happened yet. So about midway through, about 11 years in, Sarai comes with this great idea, sleep, sleep with my maid. Okay, because you see, he's having trouble. The father of the faithful is having trouble believing that God can actually bring a child about through the union of he and his wife, Sarah. You catch it even here. He says, are you kidding me? Come on, can't you do something with Ishmael? So the Lord comes to him again. This is the fifth time that the Lord comes and he doesn't come in a theophany. It's not said that it's the angel of the Lord. It says the Lord comes and speaks to him. It doesn't tell us how unlike Hagar. He appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. By the way, God reveals himself and he uses a name, El Shaddai. This is the first time that this is mentioned. It's one of the identities, one of the names that God says, I'm going to reveal myself to you. And this is one of my names. He has all these names, El Shaddai. Any of you know what it means? The Lord almighty. It's right there. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? got to keep you paying attention. The almighty God. It's actually interesting because in the Hebrew, shad means breast. So there's this thing of 
nourishment and care and provision and that speaks of the almighty God. It's not just that he's all powerful kind of out there, but he's the one who watches over you, who cares for you, feeds you, nourishes you. So God is revealing him by this name El Shaddai. And it's interesting because Abram's name is now changing. He says it's going to it's going to go from Abraham, Abram to Abraham. And if you know anything about Hebrew, that's a <laughs> that's a hey, actually. A hey. I, I put it up here for you. His, and Sarai is going to go to Sarah. Huh, and there's a huh in there, if, if you didn't notice the way I'm spitting. It's a change of one letter. One letter gets inserted into their name, and instead of Abram, it's Abraham, and instead of Sarai, it's Sarah. There's this breath that gets added. It's the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The number five, by the way, represents grace as you go through the scriptures. So I think it's interesting that there's this breath of grace that gets inserted into their names, and they become who God wants them to be. Anyway probably a bit deeper than this crowd. But that's what the hay looks like right there. Everybody go. <sighs> that's what God says. I'm adding a <sighs> to your name. I'm adding a breath to your name. And if you know anything about the New Testament, you know the word for the spirit of God is pneuma, which means wind or breath. It's rather interesting. It's almost like he's taking these fleshly people who have been acting very human and inserting his spirit into their name. Isn't that neat? I think it's neat. And I think of John chapter 20, when Jesus breathed on his disciples and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. It's rather interesting. You'll notice that God uses the same sort of pictures and analogies and metaphors all through the scripture. And they're consistent as you go through. And trust me, the more that you look, the more that you find. It just gets deeper and deeper. And so Jesus breathed on the disciples. He said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. And they went out and they healed and cast out demons and they did all of that. This is before the second chapter of Acts when the Holy Spirit comes down. So it's uh, interesting. Well, it's interesting to me. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, the Lord says. I will make nations of you. His name means exalted father, Abram. And now he's going to be the father of nations. That's what Abram means, Abraham. And he says, I'm going to make nations of you. Imagine if God came to you and told you such a thing. I'm going to make nations from you. You're like, take it easy. I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant. Notice the covenant is everlasting. You know, there have been three times that the occupants of Israel have been cast out. Once was when they ended up going to Egypt, remember? The second time was with the Babylonians. And now they've returned, 1948 of May, Israel became a nation and the Jews have now returned. Did you know God said it'll be three times that it happens? Which means they're not going to dispossess that land of the Jews anymore. That's it. They're there to stay. Because God said it's only going to be three times. I'm getting off track, but here we go. You and your descendants and your generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger and the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. Everlasting possession. It's a God's promise. And I will be their God. By the way, what is promised to them is everything that is from the um, Nile, which is over here, to the, the Tigris and Euphrates, which is over here. This land, they're actually right now just in a very small section. They're in a very small section over here. They don't even occupy a tenth of what God has said. It, it basically is like 300,000 square miles of property. That's what God has bequeathed unto them. And he says it's going to be from this river to this river, from the north to the south, but they're kind of jammed all into the corner. 
So when you see arguments and people are fighting and the Palestinians and God said it's theirs. So just know that that's the case. And God said to Abraham, notice he's called Abraham now. As for you, you shall keep my covenant you and your descendants after you through their generations. This is a covenant which I shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. Aren't you glad to be a lady, ladies? (laughs) And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between you and me. That's my sentiment exactly. (laughs) I have a son. I was there when he was circumcised. It's, It's a tough thing to watch. I'm sure it was a tougher thing to live through, but he doesn't remember. I haven't asked him, but I don't think he remembers. Why in the world would God say, I want to, I want to do this thing And what you need to do is cut off a piece of you and give it to me. And it will be a sign. A sign to who? You never thought about that, huh? If it's supposed to be some kind of a sign, who's it a sign for? I mean, you don't put signs up on the road for nobody to look at. But here's a sign that nobody looks at. It's a sign that you carry in your body. It's, carry the, it's something that you'll never forget. I'm sure they never forgot the day. But it's a test of sacrifice, isn't it? And now God is asking for the men, the leaders, to take a piece of themselves and offer it to God as a sign, a covenant. And he goes, if you don't do this, you don't have, you're not in me. It's a rather interesting thing. And there's blood that gets shed. And there's usually three days worth of healing before you can go about your business. And it's very, very interesting. God asks for this right after he has Ishmael, which I think is a direct misuse of the thing that he's now dedicating to God. Everybody go, hmm. Now you can forget about it. And so... I want you to take a knife, and it probably looked like this. It was a flint knife with a handle on it, and cut. I just think it's interesting. He was eight days old among you. You shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, one who was born in your house, bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who was born in your house and he who was bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in his flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Sounds like God's pretty serious about this. You're either going to be obedient and do what I tell you to do, or you're not part of the people of God. And it's interesting. It's not just your descendants. It's anybody under your roof. Anybody that you've employed, anybody that's living with you, anybody that's decided to be a servant of yours, anybody under your roof, everybody needs to be circumcised. It doesn't matter where they're from, which means Ishmael's going to get the knife, which is why circumcision is among the Arab people as well as it is among the Jewish people. Aha. God says very specifically, when the child's eight days old, why eight days old? There's a little thing called vitamin K, which helps your blood to coagulate. And it is at the height in a child on day eight. How did God know that? (laughs) By the way, we have seven days in a week, right? The eighth day, eight is the number of new beginnings. So I just think that's interesting. Eight, if you follow it through the scripture, you'll see it's new beginnings. And I, I don't have time to go off on that trail, but someday we'll get there. And so eight days old, you're going to take a sharp knife and go to your son's most private part. 
I love the brick Bible because, you know, I can discuss all kinds of things and just not put real pictures up. It's interesting because if you remember Jesus, when he was eight days old, Mary and Joseph took him to the temple and they offered a sacrifice because when you have a firstborn male, we're going to see this later on in the law, you have to buy them back from God because God preserved all the firstborn males when Passover occurred. And so what they have to do is pay him back kind of and say this, uh, you know, to get this child back, uh, I'm going to remember the Passover by sacrificing. So I, I basically buy my child back. We'll get there. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai. Don't call her contentious anymore. But Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. By the way, in case you're confused, it's going to happen to her, not Hagar. It's through her. And I will bless her and she shall be the mother of nations. Kings and people shall come from her. And Abraham fell on his face and laughed. Ha! He laughed at God when God said this. Do you think he believed him? Fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? He's rounding. And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Do you see he doubts? This is the father of all those who believe. This is the one whom God chose. And he falls short all the time when he gets tested, right? He's like me. I love reading the Bible because it couldn't have been written by man or it would be a much, it'd be more like the Marvel universe, you know, where everybody's strong and great and overcomes all the challenges and nobody ever fails. But he says, I'm going to bless her and she's going to have children and there are going to be so many children to come out of her. There are going to be kings that come from her and peoples that shall come from her. And so he's solidifying his covenant that he made earlier. And Abram falls to the, Abraham falls to the ground and he laughs. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be a dad. I'm, a, I'm 99 years old. So I don't, I don't care how old you are. You're not 99 and just about to have a child. That sort of economy is done. And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Do you see over the last 13 years, Abraham's become very attached to his son, his surrogate son through Hagar, which can't be a good thing for Hagar and Sarah still. And the Lord said, no, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac which means he laughs. <laughs> Little did Abram know, Abraham know that he just named his son. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. What's Ishmael's name mean? God hears. As for Ishmael, Ishmael, I hear you. Behold, I have blessed him. I will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly and he shall beget 12 princes. It sounds very familiar. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 princes of Ishmael. Interesting, nice and even, God's equal. I will make him fruitful and multiply exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac whom Sarah shall bear to you this time next year. Now he's given a timetable. He wasn't given a timetable till now. And then he finished talking to him and God went up from Abraham. He laughs. So if you want to name your kid Isaac, make sure you know what the name means. It means he laughs. Oh, I say you're going to have a son and you laugh. I want you to name him Isaac. Every time you call him, it's going to be a reminder to you. Good thing he didn't burp or something worse. So there are 12, there are 12 princes, Arab princes that actually come from Ishmael and they're listed and you can, you can find them in the scriptures. And this is essentially where they ended up all settling in. And you know, these countries here in the Middle East, we've talked about that before. So Abraham 
took Ishmael, his son, and all who were born in his house and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abram's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskin that very same day, as God had said to him. Hold still. <laughs> Abram was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So who gets circumcised first? Abraham. You see, Moses doesn't do this. God almost kills Moses because he's reluctant to do this because his wife probably was leaning on him hard not to. But we'll get there. Ishmael's son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Hey, Daddy. Yes, son. What are you doing? <laughs> it's all right. God told me to do this. The very same day Abraham was circumcised and his son Ishmael and all the men of his house born in the house who bought with money or a foreigner were circumcised with him. So Abraham gets busy right away. God says, I want you to do this, and he does it. I, I look at all of the rising and the falling of Abraham. I look at how he's tested here, and he finds a shortcut, how he lies about his wife, and how he has a child with another woman because his wife said, hey, maybe that's what God wants. I see all of these things, and then there are spots like this where Abraham says, God told me to do this. It is probably the most uncomfortable thing that I will ever be asked to do, but I'm going to do it today. How many of us would have a heart that responds that way? God showed me something. He revealed something to me, and I'm going to do it today. And he does. And I don't know how it was done, but Legos is a good way for me to be able to show this. <laughs> now, remember, he had 318 trained men in his own house that, that were warriors. How many servants and sons and people do you think traveled with him? It's like a small city. That's an all-day project. As they all line up to be circumcised, and as God explains, or as, as God explained to Abraham, Abraham explains to them, this is a covenant before God. This is a mark that I will bear on my body, which will, which will be a constant identifier that I belong to him, that I'm going to be obedient to him with every part of my body, but especially this part. I think it's a wild idea. And so everybody does. Is there a limit to how many people you should share the gospel with? Is there a limit to how many people should submit to the, oh, wait, I'm sorry, you're, a, you're really messed up. You're a drug addict and stuff. Uh, never mind. You, you don't have to come to Christ. Oh, no. Oh, you, you had a messed up background. You, you know. Oh, you're, you're you know, you, you've got everything pierced on your body. I can't talk to you about Jesus. Is there anybody it was beyond the grace of God. No. There's no one. And so Abraham evangelizes everybody in his household. I'm responsible for you. You're going to be committed to Christ. That's just the way it is. In Exodus chapter 12, this is later on during the time of Moses. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. Nor, no foreigner shall eat of it. But every man's servant who is bought with money when you have circumcised him, then he may eat of it. You see, you weren't able to eat the Passover unless you were circumcised. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat of it. In one house it shall be eaten, and you shall not carry any of the flesh outside your house, or shall you break one of its bones. Why is that important? Because Jesus Christ comes as the sacrificed lamb, and it says that none of his bones were broken. God is setting up a picture for the future so we would recognize Jesus as the Christ, the Lamb of God that could sacrifice. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when the stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let his males be circumcised. You see, it's a prerequisite to coming into the, the family of, of uh, Israel. 
and let him come near and keep it, and then he shall be a native of the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among them. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are, you got you to gotta nip the tip. You got to be circumcised. Then you can, you can observe the Passover and it has some meaning for you. This is the Old Testament. Well, we don't, we don't do any of that here, right? We don't require any of you to be circumcised, men, uh, to be a member of our church. But we do recommend for you to be a member of our church so that I know who I'm responsible for. And you can call me your pastor then. Which you may not want to do openly, but it's okay. <laughs> we have two membership classes that you have to go through just so that we understand that you're a saved person, that you know the Lord Jesus Christ and that you understand what the scripture says and what obligations it is to be part of a family. And we also ask you to fill out an application and sometimes an interview. And then you're in. That's kind of like the circumcision. Not painful. No blood. This is what they had to do to be part of Israel. I think the small things that we ask people to do are small things. There's some people say, that's awful legalistic of you, Pastor. Make me sit through two classes listening to Kovatelli. <laughs> and also, we ask that you be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ through baptism, that you've been baptized. That's it. No, no cutting of surfaces. It's very easy. But notice that this was a prerequisite. It says the Passover, including circumcision, must take place before the exodus can take place. The exodus is people leaving that bondage and, and entering into this promised land. We as Christians, as we enter into this promised land, which is the life that God wants for us, it happens when there's a circumcision in our lives. There's a self-sacrifice of ourselves. The scripture says it's dying to ourselves. You've got to lay your life down and give it to the Lord. And that's the New Testament circumcision. And it's not something that happens in your flesh on the outside. It's something that happens to your heart on the inside. In Romans 8, I want you to notice the difference between flesh and spirit. And all throughout this passage, there's flesh and spirit. Flesh likened unto circumcision. Spirit likened unto the other side of circumcision. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, as the flesh is removed, but according to the spirit. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. The righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. It's interesting when you pair this with circumcision, you're suddenly thinking circumcision, removing of flesh, right? How many of you never saw that before in this passage? It's interesting. But those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded or to, or to be physically minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God and it does not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. You see, there's been a circumcision of the heart. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. It's interesting how circumcision finds its way into the New Testament and it is a picture or a metaphor of what Christ does to us now, but it's not done in the physical it's done in the spiritual. This was a sign for a covenant between Israel and God. Jesus created a new covenant. The sign from now on is the spirit of God indwelling you. 
That's the life in the spirit. And no longer the flesh doing whatever the heck it is you feel like doing, whatever naturally comes to you in your sinful nature, but that which the spirit of God leads us to do. You guys see that? Here's another one you might like. In Galatians chapter 5, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things you wish. Aren't you glad? I am so glad I have the spirit of God because I'm not going to do the things that I would otherwise do or that I used to do. And when the spirit of God comes inside of you, you can't live in the flesh anymore because it's been nipped. The spirit of God now lives inside of us. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Notice that this was a law, a covenant. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I told you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Just like if you weren't circumcised, you weren't included in the people of Israel. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law and there, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. You see, the New Testament talks about a circumcision just like the Old Testament. And it's not just for men. Aren't you, aren't you glad, ladies, that you can join? In Deuteronomy 10, 16, it wasn't just an Old Testament understanding that you got physically circumcised because it says here, therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff necked no longer. Stiff necked is what happens when a horse doesn't want to obey you and you're pulling on the reins and he's fighting you and you're not turning, you know, the, the horse is not turning. It becomes stiff necked and it's like God's trying to tell these people what to do and where to go and they're resisting. Circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Notice it's a New Testament principle, but found in the Old Testament. God's trying to speak to us by a little show and tell. Make sense? Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. It says that God will circumcise your heart. It's not something physical done with the hands of Abraham, a guy who's 99 years old. I really hope he had a steady hand. It's done by God himself. When we give our lives, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and you, we ask him to come into our hearts, he circumcises our hearts, without which we would just be in the flesh. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Isn't it interesting when you read these passages on the tail end of talking about circumcision, how they take on a different meaning? Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is a down payment or a guarantee that you are of the people of God. The Holy Spirit is what God's trying to speak to us with the circumcision. Amen? Amen. So this was the test of self-sacrifice and Abraham does a fabulous job. He's even given a new name. God inserts his spirit into him, I believe, and Sarai to become Sarah. And suddenly they're no longer of the flesh. They're now of the spirit. And it's an entire change in the economy of things that are going on. Next week, we're going to talk about chapter 18, where these three messengers come to Abraham and they have a message of life and a message of death. And so we'll talk about that 
next week.